Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about the response and how things worked, but I um, one thing that I I didn't really hear in in Tommy's um, remarks were that APHIS really uh, coordinated this whole effort with all the states and with um, everybody that was that was working uh, on responding to this whole um, disaster. Um, so, oops, I think I just hit two. Okay, um, readiness. Uh, it was a, you know, there's been a lot of readiness, a lot of people getting ready to um, respond to whatever kind of break outbreak, whether it be with poultry or um, beef or pigs or whatever. We just, nobody knew what was going to happen first to this extent. So readiness is a hard thing, um, but I think we were fairly ready um, to respond to this. Uh, it does take a lot of people to be able to respond, and, and takes a lot of uh, planning. And APHIS, um, I think, really did a phenomenal job with all of that. Um, but when you get to the farm, or before you get to the farm, um, you've got to assess the situation. And that's so that we're, we're when the, uh, a composter is going out, uh, they are connected with the farm that they're going to be going to so they can kind of find out what's happening, um, numbers of birds, types of carbon, types of bedding, types of, you know, types of um, poultry that, that are there. So um, that's really important to get as much information beforehand so that we can start planning before we even get there for what we need to be able to do. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to be on farms in both uh, California and in North Dakota, and I was fortunate, in, I, I say I was fortunate because I was able to spend time with the farmer or the farm manager before anybody else uh, got there. And that was really nice. In, in one location, I, I wasn't there before the farmers, but in, in another location, I was, and that was good to be able to really debrief the farm, try to assess the farmer, because this is traumatic for everybody that's involved with it. Um, it's very traumatic. So, you know, just making sure that people are okay, um, emotional health and, and stuff like that, because it's, it's a difficult thing. Um, providing educational materials right away, and uh, Josh will talk more about this, but there's uh, an SOP that's been written since this outbreak uh, started. Um, so after we're assessing, looking for all the all the you know the possibilities, all, where we're going to be composting, whether it's going to be indoor or outdoor or any of that kind of stuff, we have to make sure that we're not spreading the, spreading the disease um, or exposing people to the disease more than they should be. Um, so PPE is a tremendous, a tremendously important. Generally, for uh, us, it's provided on site, and that's important. Um, but I kind of put the picture here: the farm, one of the farms that um, that I was working at. Uh, the farmer, farmers, the farm asked for PPE from the health department. And they were given, you know, a uh, very poor uh, substitute like um, surgical gown. So making sure that everybody had the proper things in the picture um, on the left, everybody had the proper breathing protection, uh, eye protection, boots, everything taped and all that kind of stuff. So we need to make sure that everybody is protected and um, we're not spreading the, the um, disease off the farm. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of different locations because we wanted to be able to respond, show how we responded to different. I only worked with turkeys, um, but when we came in, they were various ages. So we had everything from a three-pound bird 
um, that we're still alive and kicking around and very happy um, still uh, to a 35-pound turkey. And we're really composting those in different ways um, just because of mass and amount of carbon that's needed. But this is a video of the actual foam. And I thought it was important for us to, to for people to see this because it, it is um, you know, something that has to be prepared. But we're basically driving the birds um, or keeping the birds in a I call it a, like a swimming pool, but a slide in the barn, and the foam stays within those, those uh, walls, and the birds are quickly excluded. Um, all different situations. This is actually in Minnesota, um, a layer operation, and there was just no inside space. There was only one door to the whole barn, which I'm sure is not the way it's supposed to be. But um, when you're walking into some of these situations, you're going to be walking into situations where um, you have no control over what's happening, you know, what, what has been set up, and we've got to respond to it. So there was only, a, in this particular barn, there was only a, a 10 by 6 uh, space that composting could have happened indoors. They couldn't get the birds out. They couldn't get the birds out of the barn. It took them a couple of days to figure out um, what they were going to do with those. And these were uh, match, uh, died from the disease and CO2 cartridging. But they finally were able to get the birds out of the houses with conveyor belts. They set up a conveyor belt. Somebody went in and loaded birds onto the conveyor belt and got the birds out of the house. So just to, I'm going to show you other pictures of, of different um, different operations that have been difficult to work with, or, you know, sometimes easy, sometimes difficult. The, one of the biggest things that has to happen is uh, carbon. Some, some type of carbon sources have to be uh, secured. In um, some of the situations, there were, in the lower left, There's uh, there were shavings. They were available. In the upper right, um, there was, uh, we actually were using um, sunflower hulls. So they were, they're kind of a gray in color, and they were being brought in because that's the bedding that was being used in, um, in North Dakota in particular. And then as I was walking around the farm, you know, just assessing things, um, I noticed that there was a large pile of manure, and I'm actually standing on top of that pile of manure there, um, and it was 160 degrees. So, you know, that right away says, oh, wow, we've got a source of carbon here, we've got a source of hot compost here that we can be using and using as part of our mixes while we're building the pile. So we actually capped with the hot manure, and that was manure that was not from um, the outbreak. So that had been put out beforehand, or at least they, it had been out there for a while before it, the outbreak. Um, in each location, there are, we're going to have to be putting um, windrows indoors, if at all possible. Outdoors, if impossible to be indoors, like the situation that we looked at in the last slide, um, all the waterers and everything have to be have to go up. Um, the feeders, electrical wires can be dangerous, but this, in particular, was a very short house. So um, sorry about that. That was a very short house. So we were able to use bobcats in there, and that was it. You know, we really needed to work hard in that one uh, because tight was very, or space was very confined. Um, in other houses, we're going to be able to form windrows, clean up everything around the post, do all that kind of stuff. But all that needs to be done. Um, there are situations where we were layering the bird uh, in piles, a uh, base of carbon down on the bottom, and in the top left left picture you can kind of see the different layers there's a, a 
picture of okay. there's a, a picture of the base and then there are some birds in there laid in there and then there's another layer of carbon and then there's layer of birds and then that whole thing is capped as you can see down on the bottom one bottom uh, picture it really has to be everything has to be totally covered we don't want any um, material any thing that was affected by the disease to be sticking out of the pile um, that one in particular that one was a teaching pile sorry about that. that was a teaching pile just to and one of the things when we're in these situations we're really teaching people how to do it because we're not the ones on the on the loaders or anything else we're kind of directing operation and showing people how to do it so the more people we can teach how to do this um, you know then they're going to be able to to actually uh, do it through um, other routine mortality in other situations or other emergencies. Um, you can see in the right hand, uh, the left hand picture, there's a base out there and then the birds are layered down and those are like 600 foot houses. Um, so these are really, really long houses. These were uh, free span so it was easier to work in those buildings. Um, and you can see there are multiple piles in there and this was in Minnesota. Um, they ended up needing to, they used up all the space indoors and then they needed to uh, start working outdoors because there just wasn't enough space um, to do that. Some of the outdoor wind windrows are here and they had, um, you know, a lot of windrows were laid out because they had such a large outbreak. It's, it's always helpful to keep those piles as close to the buildings as possible because the more we move those birds, the more potential there is to spread that disease. And we want to do that as little as possible. We want to manipulate the birds, work with the birds as little as possible. We would just really want to get them into windrows as quickly as we can. Um, the other other materials that have to be composted. Uh, we had situations where the, in the, on the left bottom, that's a pile of seed that was just dumped into the houses because wild birds can get into the feeders sometimes, into the feed bins, and sometimes that is how the, um, the disease is spread to the population in the houses. So all of the feed that was on site of all these operations needed to be composted. Sometimes it did go to a landfill or was moved off site. Um, the eggs had to be dealt with. Sometimes they were going to a landfill or sometimes they were being buried. Um, the litter has to be incorporated into the piles and the easiest way, as you can see from some of the photos, the easiest way to do that is to incorporate the litter in, in with the birds because that's a good carbon source and we need to be using that. Um, so basically a, a, a path is cleared in the, in the building and it really depends on how that building is supported, whether you're going to have one down the middle or whether you're going to have them on the sides, have the windrows on the sides. Um, in this case, we had about 30 pound birds that we were incorporating into the windrows. Um, the carbon, we, we cleared a path because you have a lot of um, a lot of debris on the floor of the barn, so it's bedding, it's birds, it's all kinds of things. And by taking the loader down the center of that building and moving that the material to the side, you can break that material up a little bit because there is carbon down there, but it's carbon without any oxygen. And it really does, just doesn't work. We really need carbon that has oxygen, uh, that allows oxygen to come into it, or else we won't be able to allow those piles to be heated. So clear the center in this case, put uh, shavings down as a carbon source and uh, 12 to 15 inches of shavings. And then, as you can see, the birds on the side are mixed in with the with the um, manure and the and the litter that we moved off. Then those are placed back on the bed, um, and and those um, birds are are placed into windrows. So this is a windrow with 
this was 60,000 turkeys, but the farm had 60,000 that we were working with. Um, that's a 60, you know, 600 foot building, and we were able to just make one very long windrow in that building and allow that to process. Um, this, I ran into this picture yesterday, and I said, well, this is what it's really after we've clean after we've done the composting, uh, after we've we've uh, moved the material out of the barn, and that's going to be 14 to 21 days. Um, the barn should be very clean like this, and then they have to come in and disinfect those barns so that they're they're totally uh, clean and new birds can can be moved in. So temperatures and release times. So the, heat, the piles should heat up very quickly. Um, and we like to see them heating up in, in, you know, six to 24 hours. We really should be seeing some good temperatures in those piles. And the temperatures need to be between um, 131 and 160 is what we really want to achieve. When we are, when if we have a pile that's really cool, a pile that's like at 60 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That pile may or may not creep up to um, creep up to the right temperature, so we have to be careful about that. We need to make sure that there's plenty of good uh, loose carbon underneath those so that the air can get in and we can actually allow the microbes to do the work that they need to do. Um, before we went into this, we didn't really have um, time temperature release, but we do have we did have um, EPA rules, which are the EPA 503 rules, which apply to human sludge. So looking at pathogens, looking at viruses, looking at all that kind of stuff. So uh, those were the temperatures really that were adopted for where we wanted to be with, with this virus. And also we were looking at experience that um, Virginia had encountered in low-path AI outbreaks where they had been composting. Should composting be inside or outside? Um, if you can compost indoors in the barns, that's the preferred method. But in some cases, there were miles of windrows, and there just wasn't enough um, room, especially in the laying operations. There wasn't enough room inside barns. So as much as possible, they were kept close to the barn. Um, one of the questions that I had is, what should be done with the fans uh, and general air circulation? And, you know, just because of disease transfer and disease spread, uh, when those fans are going, if there's a positive AI, some of that, the emissions from those barns are going to be blowing out uh, avian influenza. So something that we need to consider and think about a little bit more, and a lot of people have been thinking about this. Um, when are the piles done? So we, we they may be done in 14 to 21 days if our temperatures are high enough in the building, and then the material needs to be moved out of the building, and then it can it can be turned and it can be allowed to finish and finish into a, a finished compost. Uh, our goal here really is sanitation, not making a, a high quality compost. We are still going to have a pretty good co compost out of all of this with good nutrients and all. But um, our primary goal with this is to, to deactivate the, the avian influenza. And then using the compost afterwards. Um, and that's generally used on the farms, hopefully used on the farm. Not It can be sold, I suppose, um, but I don't know what kind of rulings we're looking at for that. When responding to the unknown, um, just in, in to capture some of my thoughts, um, understand where the farm and the farm managers are coming from, um, work with them. It, it can be very heated at times just because people are overwhelmed already and they're like, oh, what do you want me to do next and is this really necessary? And so um, just, you know, some patience is very important when we're when we're working on on these farms. Um, 
assess the best methods to use, and it, it is going to be different on different farms. Um, live and dead, dead stock, feed, water, eggs, all that stuff has to be dealt with. Um, guidance has been developed that's flexible, but also addresses all different types of situations because, as I said, we're going to have a lot of different situations to work in. Um, are we more prepared than before the outbreak? Definitely. I think a lot of people are, and hopefully some of these educational um, workshops and meetings and the practice that we're all getting is helping us be more prepared.